following webinar is the third in a series of five webinars covering the topic of management of hand arm vibration exposure. In this third webinar, we will look at the topic of measuring a tool's vibration magnitude. From this webinar, you would expect you to become aware of the relevant standards such as ISO 8041 and ISO 5349. Have an overview of a three axis measurement of a tool's vibration. And understand that a tool will have a range of vibration magnitudes. And the sort of information that's available from the HSE to explain that vibration magnitude range. And finally, you'll gain an understanding of the difference between measuring vibration magnitude and monitoring hand arm vibration exposure. As a reminder, to measure exposure to hand arm vibration requires a combination of two factors. And it can be expressed in two different units of measure. So daily exposure to vibration can be expressed in the equivalent eight hours acceleration, and that is an A8 in meters per second squared, or it can be measured in exposure points. In both methods, you are combining the vibration magnitude during exposure to the duration of the time of that exposure. In exposure points, since the exposure action value in A8 is 2.5 and T0 is 8, the exposure points equation can be further simplified to be exposure points is 2 times the time of exposure times the vibration magnitude of exposure squared. The benefit of the exposure point system is that when you're combining risk from more than one activity, you can combine that risk by simply adding the values in points together. Taking a look at the standards. ISO 5349 is the standard which defines how to calculate daily average exposure by combining the time of exposure with a representative vibration magnitude. It also includes within an appendix a definition of how to measure vibration on a tool. ISO 8041 is a standard that provides the detail of an instrument's capabilities that are needed in order to make a measurement of a tool's vibration. It also gives some basic advice on how to apply the techniques to different types of tools. EN 12096 is a standard that is required to be followed by the manufacturers of tool. This is a standard that defines how a manufacturer should declare and verify the vibration magnitude of their tools. And it defines their responsibilities in declaring that vibration magnitude level. So all tool manufacturers need to comply with EN 12096. EN 6075 sorry, EN 60745 is the standard which defines the detailed protocol, a test protocol that's needed for specific types of tools and it is a series of standards. The laboratory based conditions to ensure the repeatability across tool types and it does this by removing the dependency on how the tool is used and we'll see more of this in the coming slides. So how do you conduct a measurement of vibration magnitude? 
This requires an instrument that's compliant to 8041. It requires that the measurement takes place in three axes, and then that, that those measurements in the three axes are combined to, con to establish a total value of vibration. The three axes um, are to do with the direction that the energy propagates into the hand, so whether that be across the palm, through the palm, or into the wrist. The three axes are combined equally, but the way in which the energy transmits into the hand will depend on the tool type. ISO 8041 requires that the accelerometers be firmly attached to the grip point of the tool no more than 10 millimetres from where the hand will grip the tool. The vibration measurement is a skilled process which should only be carried out with a trained technician. It quite commonly can lead to anomalies, anomalies that a technician will be able to identify. Typically, measurement is carried out for a one minute period and then an average taken over three measurements to give what is expected to be a typical value. Again, what is very important to understand while a measurement is taking place is to know all of the conditions around the measurement so that, we, that you are in a position to determine if that measurement condition is consistent with the use of the tool that you would then want to carry out a risk assessment for. It should be understood that all tools will range in their vibration magnitude. The graphic here illustrates work carried out by the health and safety laboratories, um, published in an original version of their guidance L140, and then subsequently replaced by Appendix 3 and tables of values for a number of tools. But the graphic is quite illustrative in showing you that for any particular tool type, the vibration magnitude will range from a, a minimal value to a maximum value, which is simply dependent on how the tool is being used or what the tool is being used for. In the graphic, the HSC have illustrated with a mark on the left, the manufacturer's declared value, and the mark on the right, the mean of all their measurements. If we look at the chipping hammer, it's ranging from 10 meters per second squared to 26 meters per second squared. The manufacturer has declared about 11. The HSC are seeing a mean value about 16. What might be obvious from this is that the manufacturer's value need not be representative of when these tests have then subsequently been carried out by the HIC. So in the case of the impact drill, it is round approaching the middle or the mean. For the chipping hammer, it's at the lower end of the spread. And for the rock drill, it's actually lower than any of the measurements taken by the HIC labs. Why that's the case will be explained in a few uh, slides. But to understand the value of manufacturers declaring um, their vibration magnitude for their tool, consider the additional data here for chipping hammer B and chipping hammer C. These are all similar tools of a similar tool type, but from three different manufacturers, A, B, and C. And you would see from all of the data that the chipping hammer C is a lower risk tool than A or B. And that is the case also in the declared vibration values. So when considering a source for vibration magnitude data for use in a risk assessment of exposure to hand arm vibration, it's important to remember that not all vibration data is collected for that purpose. There are many purposes that that data might be collected. So it's important that when you're looking for data for, to be used in a risk assessment, that it is data that is representative of the work activities to be undertaken, and importantly, 
is not one that will lead to an underestimate of that exposure risk. Going back to manufacturers declared vibration magnitudes, the HSE produced a report in 2011 where they evaluated what was a new standard at the time, the standard EN 60745, which defines how manufacturers should declare their vibration magnitude. And in that report, they say that relative to field measurements undertaken by the HSL, only on 6% of cases did the manufacturer's data exceed the HSE's data. The report did identify that the standard in itself was a competent standard because it allowed the HSE or the HSE labs at more than one location to carry out their measurements very consistently. Even though the measurements could be carried out very consistently, it didn't mean that the measurements, however, reflected the sort of vibration magnitudes that the HSE went on to measure for the tools when they were used in a field application. The recommendation therefore from that report was that duty holders should be advised to take care when using manufacturers data for the purpose of a risk assessment. And to understand why that may be the case, we'll illustrate two examples of what the standard calls for when manufacturers are carrying out their testing of their tools. So the first example here is for an angle grinder. The test method defined for angle grinders involves the use of a weighting balance, which is used to avoid the tool coming into contact with the surface. So it ensures that the tool is specifically unbalanced and then by doing so it will produce a vibration performance which then for other manufacturers using the same pro test process you, it will be a comparative measurement but it is not therefore one which is the same as the tool being used for its purpose when it is in contact with the surface. In a similar manner, for braking type tools, a Dynalode test rig is used. And what this Dynalode test rig does is it results in the tool end essentially being vibrating against rather some steel balls held within the column of the tool. It also means that the tool does not have to be held by the, a tool user. So again, you get very consistent measurements between tool manufacturers, but in during this test, no material is being broken by the tool, and therefore this laboratory test does not represent what real use field measurements of the tool would find. So to help with the challenges to duty holders of finding a suitable vibration magnitude, the HSE have published a table in Appendix 3 to their L140 guidance. And in this table, for a number of, of different types used across a number of different industries, the HSE produced data from a, a, a large number of measurements of such tools. So from real measurements, they give the lower range and upper range for the tools expressed in percentiles. So the 10% percentile means no more than 10% of results were below this value. And for the 90% percentile, it means no more than 10% of results were above this value. So 80% of the measurement results fell between the range of the lower and upper results. 
And what the HSC would recommend for use in risk assessment is the 75th percentile of results of their results were used. So for each tool, they have a recommended value of vibration magnitude to use in risk assessments. The following three slides um, reproduce the information available from the HSE's Appendix 3. First slide here is a grouping of tools which might typically be seen in a construction or civil engineering type application. And again, are there to demonstrate the wide range of vibration magnitudes possible from the tool types. And an example, the demolition hammer um, can vary from 10 to 21 meters per second squared and will be heavily influenced by how the operator uses the tool. In this particular type of tool, it's important that the operators do not push too hard. And this sort of information that's available within Appendix 3 is perhaps the, of the most valuable in terms of helping you manage your employees' risk. An interesting example included in this sheet is the stone hammer. Stone masonry as a profession is an incredibly high risky type occupation in terms of exposure to hand arm vibration. And it's not always about the use of power tools. Simply manual tools will generate high levels of vibration that can cause harm, whether that's in using the hammer or in holding the chisel. And hence, it's important that the chisel should have some sort of vibration, vibration reduction sleeving attached to it. The second grouping here are ones that you might see in more manufacturing type environments. Um, you see with tools like orbital sanders, Again, it's very, very important in terms of both the technique of the operator and how much force they apply to the tool. The less force is better in terms of letting to the tool do its work and minimizing the vibration impacted to the individual. And also the use of correct, uh, uh, appropriate abrasives and their condition will very much influence orbital sanders and equally angle grinders. Another example is providing in this, provided in this slide in terms of hand tools, which is not actually a tool, but holding the work piece against a vibrating surface. Many people would consider this a very difficult uh, type of situation to make a measurement for that doesn't lessen the situation that the person who's holding the piece is very much being exposed to vibration. third slide covers more tools that you might see uh, within a grounds maintenance type environment. Again, some very wide ranges are possible if we look at the example of the hedge trimmer. Um, and these are, this is vibration data for when the, the tool is being used for its purpose. You can get even higher levels of vibration if trying to use this type of tool inappropriately, for instance, if the, the branch is too thick and it really should be a chainsaw that's being used, if you use instead a hedge trimmer, you will get incredibly high vibration magnitudes. With chainsaw, it's very much important that the teeth are kept sharp and in good conditions. Another example here, which you may be surprised of on, is, is a ride on mower, for sure, this type of device will also give rise to whole body vibration to the user through the seat. But in gripping the, the wheel or the handles of the mower, hand arm vibration will also be experienced to the order of magnitude of three to seven meters per second square. In this next slide, some details were provided by the HSC on the extent to which a, a user's competency in using a tool can make a difference to uh, the vibration they experience. And therefore, if you convert that to the amount of time that they use the tool, it can be very significant. So in the example at the top, the average vibration measured was nine meters per second squared. 
and the operator was found to be using it in a manner where they didn't switch off the tool when retrieving it from uh, the surface. When they were given training on how to do that uh, and some other training on techniques such as how they leaned into the tool and put pressure on the tool, they, they were able to reduce the actual measured vibration down to 5.5 meters per second squared. So the difference that that makes in terms of a change from 9 to 5.5 me 5 meters per second squared on time to use a tool safely, for 9 meters per second squared, you would reach the action value within 37 minutes. But after the training, that time was extended to 100 minutes. And in terms of limit value, that became 150 minutes versus 400 minutes. Again, very significant changes in the amount of time that the tool can be used by applying, applying training in the techniques of using the tool. As a final topic, we will explore the difference between measurement of vibration magnitude and monitoring of exposure to hand-arm vibration. The measurement of vibration magnitude, as we have explained, can be in compliance with standards and it involves the positioning of an accelerometer within 10 millimeters of the grip point of the tool. It also typically requires a precision measurement to carry out the precision instrument to carry out the measurement and a skilled technician um, who has experience in doing such tests. While the vibration information from this measurement may be suitable for use in a risk assessment if the test conditions are similar to the use of the tool for which the risk assessment was to be carried out, it also is not the type of measurement that allows you to gather lots of information on the full use of the tool or perhaps the use of multiple tool on the course of a working day. It's also important to note that according to the vibration regulations, the control of vibration at work 2005, it is not a requirement to carry out a measurement in order to do an assessment of someone's exposure to hand arm vibration. Rather, to carry out the assessment, it's important simply that the vibration magnitude be probably that which is experienced by the tool user during tool use. By contrast, there exist a number of tools available in the marketplace which are intended for the purpose of monitoring exposure to hand arm vibration to gather data in a, a manner that allows you to gather data on the use of multiple tools and all the use of those tools through the course of the working day. And that type of information is information which can be useful in assessing a person's exposure to hand arm vibration, but it's not data that could be said to be in compliance with the standard to measure vibration exposure. No matter whether they excel, those tools are mounted on the tool themselves or on the individual, because of the nature of where the accelerometers are positioned and how the data is gathered, it's not possible to say that they truly comply with the standard, but they may also have benefits in terms of whether that data is representative of exposure risk. To give you an idea of the type of instruments that are available in the marketplace, those instruments that would comply with the standards in terms of making a measurement include those shown here from manufacturers such as Larson Davis, Svantec, Brill and Kerr, and Castle. Again, they all require use of a skilled technician. Also, the devices require annual calibration. And they will give you a snapshot in time 
set of data on vibration magnitude of the tool, which you still need to try and determine, is that typical of the tool's future use when you're assessing someone's risk from using a particular tool. In terms of the type of technologies that are available to monitor, there's actually a wide range of different types available. Um, there's a device from Havi, which is mounted on the tool as a monitor. That monitor will gather exposure data based on trigger time and the vibration ma magnitude information that you enter into the device and is therefore static. It gathers that data and it can transmit that data to a watch to display the information to the tool user. Kuro have a device uh, branded the Q2. This device measures vibration, calculates exposure points based on that measurement only. But again, that measurement, because of the positioning of the device, will not be in compliance to 8041, and it does require very careful mounting of the device. Avsco have developed a product uh, which is held between the fingers and is pressed against the tool. It measures the tool vibration, but it does require um, some skill in terms of interpreting the data from the device. In Reactech, we have a product called Havewear, and we calculate the exposure in two ways at the same time. So for every use of the tool, there's two sets of data, one which use a static pre-programmed vibration magnitude, and that allows you to get information based on what you might expect the tool to do. And the second is based on a measurement that is taken by triaxial accelerometers mounted in the device, which is intended to approximate the real-time vibration at the grip point. So in summary, we have shown that the measurement of vibration magnitude of a tool is a process that requires a skilled technician to carry out the, the job in order to comply with standards. We've also established that vibration data is collected for many purposes and is therefore not always suitable for using in the risk assessment of a person's daily exposure to vibration. Tool measurements are not required to be carried out for the risk assessment of daily exposure to hand arm vibration, provided that the vibration magnitude data that is used for that risk assessment is credible. And that really means that it should be representative of the work activities to be undertaken. Again, the legal requirement is that the vibration magnitude is probably that which was uh, experienced when the person was using the tool as part of that assessment. It is important that any source of vibration magnitude data does not underestimate the risk of exposure to that vibration. There do exist technologies which will help monitor a person's daily exposure to hand arm vibration by simplifying the gathering of that hand arm vibration exposure data. Again, returning to the topic of vibration measurement, vibration measurement is a process uh, which requires skilled people to carry out that measurement. It requires equipment to a particular standard. But despite that accuracy, despite that skill, the challenge remains being sure that that vibration magnitude measurement is suitable to be used in a risk assessment of exposure to hand arm vibration. So that concludes this particular seminar. Um, we'll remind you again of some useful links uh, and additional reading for you to look at the subject uh, in any more depth that you may want to.